our last part of our lecture is about mutation. Uh, I wanted to point out some things that go on relative to somatic mutation. And we said earlier there's somatic and, of course, a germline mutation. Um, and germline mutation gets passed on, somatic doesn't. But I don't want to leave us with the idea that somatic mutations aren't very, very important. And in fact, uh, uh, some very interesting ideas that can come out of looking at somatic mutations. Now, one of the places we really see somatic mutations occurs during is during the development of embryogenesis, right? So we have fertilized egg. Fertilized egg divide into two, four, six, eight, eventually becomes a blastula, an open uh, coelom in the middle of it, and then eventually begins to start making tissue types. Well, there's replication involved. There's also other in things that can happen. And depending on when the mutation arises, right, uh, you can have a very different effect on the outcome. So this first little part shows you one where at first cell division, so you've got two cells now, one during that division or during that replication process, you had a mutation, it means that half your cell lines are going to carry that mutation, right? Now they're going to be somatic, but they're going to carry it. If it occurs later on, then you have a mix of, of it, and it just depends on further and further down the line um, how, much, how many cells are actually affected by it. Okay. In fact, you could have almost none affected, or you could have some very, very late in the process, including some gonadal ones that will occur, all right, that then are, in fact, are uh, transmitted. But uh, you can have then parts of your body being formed. Now, we, of course, call this mosaicism, right, somatic mosaicism. Um, again, uh, in, in mammals, uh, humans and other mammals, we're somatic uh, as far as uh, the X chromosome anyway, right, because we have, uh, in the females, have two X chromosomes. Uh, one of them gets shunt away as a bar body, and we use the other one, so we're a mosaic for that anyway. But here we're talking about mutational forms, things that make distinct populations uh, within the cell structures themselves. So I thought I'd just give a few examples to kind of show you that it does can have a major effect. Okay? One of them is, is the Sturge-Weber syndrome. This effect uh, is a, a fairly straightforward. On chromosome number nine, uh, there is a single mutation. Okay. Uh, and this mutation involves a change in a G to an A. So it's a transitional mutation, right? Very common. This does have an effect because it's a second position, which means an arginine residue um, gets replaced and you end up with a missense mutation that occurs. And you get a lot of outcomes from this. You get what's known as this cherry structure, this kind of um, covering on system. Now, what this impacts is uh, the N, is the GNAQ gene a mutation, okay? And this gene is involved in uh, a number of protein functions, including transmembrane uh, developments. It's, it's part of a signaling pathway. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is it will cause, it, it will basically, this mutation turns it on and constitutively on so that the protein is producing uh, all the time uh, it's far too much production, uh, at least of the signaling that's going on, and you end up with this sort of constant uh, growth in patterns. And here's some brains showing these little pictures are showing you sort of uh, where there are some of, of these mosaicisms that occurred inside of brains. And they can be very dramatic. I mean, and, and again, it depends on when it happens, right? If it happens very, very, very late in the process, you may just have a few parts of the skin cells, kind of like a calico cat. Uh, be affected, right? If it occurs very early on, then you can have to severe to, to a truly lethal condition that can occur. Uh, and again, it's just a simple uh, transitional mutation that's occurring, uh, but it depends on when it occurs, and it's, and it's not known as a heritable one. This isn't something that you, you, that you have in the gonadal system. Uh, it occurs during fetal development. So it is a classic of a uh, production, and it produces mosaicism. It produces normal cells, lots of normal cells, and then cells that have the mutation in them. Okay, uh, a couple of more. One, uh, the uh, McCoon uh, Albright, often known just as the Albright uh, syndrome. This one is a, a different gene. It's the GNAS gene, um, and it can cause lots of things. This gene is involved with. Um, of production of, of a number of things. And we, again, we get an overexpression of the gene. It's a, once again, a simple mutation. Uh, there's an arginine residue being replaced by histine or cysteine residue. Um, and we, it ends up being lots of things. One of the things that's very classic that you see from this is what's called a cafe de lump, which is these brown spots uh, on people. Okay, And they'll, they'll occur 
wherever the, uh, the mutation occurred. And they can be fairly small, as this individual just has a few, or they can cover a significant part of the body. Again, depending on when they developed. Obviously, in this individual in A up here, it probably occurred very early on uh, during the early development stages. Okay. Now, this <clears throat> protein's involved in a number of things, but uh, it's involved in, in some growth and structures of bones, as well as some signaling uh, of some proteins and other things that go on. And overexpression, depending on when it occurs, you can have fairly simple things where you just have some discoloration, basically, and a few cell lines that are, uh, that are affected, all the way up to having uh, some major uh, morphological feature problems that can occur. Now, <clears throat> in reality, what's interesting about it is it, it is a dominant lethal. If it occurs, you know, early on enough, it will cause death of the embryo. It's somatic, right? It's not passed on. It's not something you, the, the mother or father produced in their replication. It's something that occurs uh, almost completely de novo during fetal development. Uh, it ends up producing these, these coffee deluxe uh, stains that have, it can pr pr uh, produce uh, hyperthyroidism, uh, Cushing's disease. Interestingly, it, it will often produce uh, precocious uh, puberty. And it's primarily in females that it produces this. And it's thought to be because of a, a overproduction of estrogen, because part of what it does is signal uh, hormone uh, instructions. And the, uh, it, some of these females, these children can actually start menstrual bleeding at age three, you know, uh, they, they, long before the secondary traits of, of breast enlargement and, and hair patterning and things occur later. But, but it's obviously it's thought that it's probably just a production, uh, of, again, of, of estrogen production. Uh, males uh, don't tend to have the, uh, as much of the precocious puberty uh, respective because the, it's, it seems to be more responsive to, to estrogen. But anyway, it's a dominant lethal mutation. Uh, if you get it too early on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause lethality in the system. And then finally, uh, there's a, uh, several mutations, but there's one at least of the AKT1 gene. Uh, this is a, a G to A, right? And it's uh, going to be a, a, a glutamic acid lysine, I'm trying to think here. This one has lots of effects. Um, this gene is involved in production of, of things like bone, uh, and tissue, and it leads to, in some cases, things for Proteus syndrome. Proteus syndrome is uh, overgrowth of tissues in, in irregular patterns, and, and the problem here is that it's a, it is, once again, a somatic mutation that occurs during embryonic development, so some cell lines are completely normal, and then other cell lines have this overexpressional problem that, that that occurs. And it is a large overexpressional problem. It's a big signaling protein. It's involved in signaling and, and uh, it's cell signaling. And it's involved in uh, signaling like adrenal glands, the pituitary glands, and all sorts of things. And what basically happens is that it just overproduces. It causes, it, it causes these growth factors uh, that are important to, from the hormonal perspective uh, to be overly produced. And you get these over, what are known as overgrowth syndromes that occur. Um, it also is involved in, in a number of um, oncogene production. Oncogenes are cancer genes. Uh, it can be found in various forms of lung cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, and it's a fairly common mutation actually found uh, in colorectal cancers as well. So, uh, in, and again, it's, it's completely somatic and it can occur in times. It can occur early during fetal development or embryonic development, or in, in the case of uh, colorectal cancers, it, it occurs later on after, you know, because we're replacing those inner uh, cells constantly in our, in our digestive system, and there's going through lots of replication, and you end up having it. So it's one of the things that causes polyps. Interestingly, it's been found uh, to also be associated with schizophrenia. Uh, not Obviously not all cases of schizophrenia in any way, but because our neural systems are very complex, but uh, there some of the, the very severe and, and sort of early onset cases of schizophrenia have been linked to, uh, to mutations in the AKT1 gene that occur uh, during, um, a, a, you know, fetal development as part of uh, neurogenesis. So it's clearly a fob there. And probably that has something to do with, again, with hormonal instruction uh, from the over signaling from the adrenal glands, the pituitary glands, and other other glands that, that this particular one's involved in. All right, and then the last one I want to talk about is sort of a general case here, and it's kind of interesting. Um, 
was chromosomal uh, mosaicism. The last three things all had to do with point mutations, uh, but we know there's chromosomal uh, mosaicisms. And remember, we go way back to the chromosome lectures, and we said somewhere 15, 20% of all conceptions end in spontaneous abortions and miscarriages, and a huge proportion of those, up to 50% of them, are, of course, are due to aneuploidies, right? Uh, the others are due to, to health, environment, and those sorts of things, but uh, a, a good proportion. And again, those numbers, if you look around the web, they'll bounce around a little bit, but you get the idea. We're talking about a significant portion uh, of, the, of these conceptions actually not going fully to term, and of those not going to fully to term, a large number due to chromosome anomalies. And we've said that before. Um, and so we just don't tolerate in humans and, and most uh, mammals um, long-term production of, of uh, these individuals that have this. Now, one of the places this has been found in, of course, is when you're trying to do uh, in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization, eggs are brought from females. The male the sperm is put together. You get a fertilized egg. You wait for a few cycles uh, for the, through the development phase, and then you implant those eggs. Okay, and what they found is that the the success rate uh, really is age dependent. Okay, the, there's a uh, a real loss of the success of it as, as in the female's age, which is unfortunate because often it's females in their 30s and so that you know, have not been able to have children that are trying to go through this process. Uh, but there's a failure rate. In fact, um, in some cases, it can be as low as 20% success um, and maybe 35, some, you know, depending on the age again. But, but average wise, that's about what it is. It can be, of course, much higher down here in young females. Uh, much, much lower up here in older females, but averaging out somewhere around 35% success. And one of the things that, that people have found is when they when they actually look at these uh, pre-implantation uh, zygotes, when they look at them and they've already formed up and they formed a, you know, a blastocele, so they wait uh, enough uh, stages. Um, there's techniques now where we can pull a few cells. In fact, uh, you can actually pull a single cell uh, out uh, very early on, and they're starting to do this now at the four cell stage. Uh, you can pull a single cell out, and put it through and sequence it, do a genetic analysis of it, and look for various types of uh, aneuploidies and look for uh, SNPs and all sorts of things. And, and uh, using various techniques, including just simple sequencing uh, and, and other things, they can actually look to see what's going on in those cells before they implant them. Um, and what's quite interesting is that in some of these studies that have been done, uh, looking at these pre-implantation em embryos, um, a very, only a very small number of them actually from this in vivo uh, fertilization technique are actually diploid. Uh, in some studies, uh, they found it's up as high as 60 to 70 percent can be mosaics. And they're often mosaics where, when we mean mosaics there, we mean we're looking at this stage here, this blastial stage. Uh, that you're finding that the majority of the cells in there are diploid, but there's some aneuploid cells in there as well. Um, and there's some where the entire thing has got this aneuploid condition. It's a mosaic where there's very few of the cells are actually diploid. Uh, you've got some that, are, that are, have uh, a trisomy, some that have a monosomy. You've got you know, all sort of a real mix that are found in there. It turns out to be fairly common. Now, other studies uh, in more in more recent times, this is 2011, where this was done, uh, techniques have continually get better, and this le level is dropping quite a bit um, down. Uh, but the point is, they they exist. Now, one really interesting study that went through, of course, a lot of mechanics uh, to allow this study to occur is that uh, when you're doing these these pre-testing. Uh, you don't implant anything that isn't just a normal diploid, right? That's the, the rules. Uh, but people wondered, well, what happens when you do implant one of these uh, diploid aneuploids where you have a few of the cells that are aneuploid? So they developed a, a system, uh, went through all the protocols to, to get it approved, found volunteers to allow it to be implanted, um, and um, they implanted some, some cell lines that were like this, some, some in the embryos. Um, and what it turned out is that the during the development phase, the aneuploid condition was removed. Uh, the diploid cells either outcompeted the aneuploid cells, or there was some correction that went on. Um, and it turned out that uh, in the cases that uh, the study they did with just a few individuals, that every one of the live births was a was a normal uh, diploid. So even though we produce these, apparently there is a, some mechanism either by the cells themselves outcompeting the aneuploid cells, 
or by some other condition that in fact mosaic at least chromosome level mosaicism and this wouldn't be true for a single point well you know a point mutation things at all but it, it just adds a whole dimension to this whole con this whole idea of, of fetal development and what's going on now you've got cells competing with one another uh, for you know which ones are actually going to be the ones that produce the, the final outcome for the most part uh, so it's a really interesting study and it kind of brings home the whole idea of of both chromosome mosaicism, how common it really is, as well as there's potentially some some mechanisms by which we can repair it. Okay, well we've worked completely through uh, all that I wanted to do on mutation. We could go a lot further and spend much much more time on it. There's some really interesting things that we could say about it. Of course, we could list syndrome after syndrome after syndrome. But I've given you the basics. Like we've gone back to the very classic stuff about transitions and transversions. We walked through some of the effects of those. We talked about uh, you know other types with the uh, with these uh, transposons and some of the bigger pictures of mutations as well. And we're ending up here back cycling back to chromosomes uh, and aneuploids. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good uh, look at that. Uh, vision. So this will be the last of the lectures on mutation.